Good morning. Welcome. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor, Kalimera, <laughs> Tikanis, Kala. <laughs> well, Greek. I didn't know my Greek teacher was going to be here this morning, so we're going to get rid of all the Greek <laughs> in the sermon <laughs> because I will pronounce it wrongly. We're going to talk about that, actually. I speak English wrongly anyway, so whatever. I want to thank Tony, Tony Johnson, for preaching a great message last week. Yes, it was very, very, very good. He's a nice guy, even when you meet him at work and you can call him by his first name there, Deputy. Deputy, that's, that's what you should call him if you meet him at work. That's good for you. Don't, don't worry about it. <coughs> Joe, you, you can keep Aiden in here if you want. He's not going to bother me. We pray for Aiden every single week in our family. So today, we're going to continue in the rest of the story. We've been talking about Solomon. We looked at works attributed to him, like the Proverbs. Heather took us through the Proverbs the week before Tony's message. Today, we're going to continue talking about works attributed to him. And you're going to find out next week why I'm saying attributed so much. We'll look into that a little bit. We saw that sometimes Solomon had to be a judge. Kings back then would judge cases. We saw one in particular that seemed pretty cut and dry. Pun intended, right? Get the sword. Some people were paying attention. So there were two prostitutes literally arguing about whose baby it was. As Solomon said, well, let's cut it in half, revealing then the true mother of the child wouldn't want the child to be cut in half. Now, some cases are like this, where someone's totally right and someone's totally wrong, and it's really obvious. But, but as a pastor... I've noticed that mm, there's usually two sides to every story. It's a little bit of both going on. And it's like this in court cases, too. So I don't know about other states because, well, I do. But in Florida, <laughs> if you're in a civil case, they make you see a mediator first. You go to mediation before you get to the judge. And there's good reason for this because they're trying to get you to see both sides. Now, a good mediator is like a good pastor. He's always going from room to room, and he's, well, don't you see how they might feel this way about that? And get them to kind of come into some type of agreement. And a really good mediator will say this, you may be right, but how much are you willing to pay <laughs> to be right? <laughs> this is going to be very expensive. So that's what they're doing. They're trying to get you to come into some type of agreement. And this is what pastors do, right? I'm trying to get you to see the other side, whether it's a married couple, whether it's two people arguing about nothing. You know, you're trying to say, look, don't you see how this person could be a little bit right here and to come into agreement? It's usually the way it is. But <laughs> some cases are totally lopsided where someone is totally wrong. And I want to share a few of those with you this morning. So we're going to go back to 2018. This was a case where a man sued to legally change his age because it was affecting his chances on Tinder. Plaintiff lost. I'm glad not a lot of you laughed because I'm glad that not a lot of you know what Tinder is. <laughs> 2017, 2017, no, no, let's go back to 2012, a kidnapper sued his hostages for escaping, lawsuit dismissed, <laughs> go back to 1993, a man sued Anheuser-Busch because drinking their beer did not make his fantasies come true, plaintiff lost, a man sued himself in 1995 for $5 million for violating his own religious beliefs. This guy was ahead of his time. You know, a lot of people all of a sudden have really strong religious beliefs, and they want me to sign waivers for them, but I never see them in church. It's kind of weird. Case dismissed. Get out of my office. And here's a real special one. <laughs> a man sued his employer because he was disabled, and then they discriminated against him. You see, he was a firefighter, 
and he had a fear of fire. Kind of weird. All right, let's continue in the rest of the story. That's my icebreaker. It'll come full circle, don't worry. So we're in Ecclesiastes. It follows the Proverbs, and it is, like the Proverbs, wisdom literature. It's usually attributed to Solomon. That's the lens we're going to look at it through this week. But there's reasons some people say Solomon didn't write it. We'll do that next week. Greek, title, fact, ecclesia, means church. Really better, probably, assembly. Ecclesia means church. Ecclesiastes. It's kind of like a butchered form of that word. They're not pronouncing it right. <laughs> Theodore's saying, no, they're not. It's not right. But it's the same word, the same meaning. It's to the assembly. So this is from the teacher. We're going to say Solomon this morning. To the assembly. Now ask yourself a question. Most people would say, wait, hey, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. But we've learned through the series that the church was looking at the Greek version. That is the Bible of the early church. It's all in Greek. And here's some evidence. Why would a Hebrew book have a Greek title? Ooh. So kind of cool little fun flat fact here, not a flact. I don't know what a flact is. I probably said a bad word. Ecclesiastes, I've said it before. It teaches you how to read your Bible. So I've often said that reading Ecclesiastes all the way through in one sitting, it's not that hard, 12 short chapters, they are very short, it teaches you how to read and understand your Bible. It's interesting, and we'll get there. So how should we read it? <laughs> First, all the way through before coming to conclusions. All the way through, before coming to conclusions and developing really solid opinions about what it says. That's interesting. What if we took any other book, any other book, and we went to the book club discussion, right? We didn't read it. <laughs> we just read like a little bit from chapter 1, a little bit from chapter 12, a little bit here, a little bit there, but just one line in each chapter, right? Our favorite line each day, barely read it, showed up to the book club and said, you know, I really think that this is what happened, but it didn't happen. That would sound stupid, right? So why do we do that with the Bible? Anyway, I'll move on. <laughs> we should avoid absolutes. I'm going to put a disclaimer on this one. Again, like the cases. When you look at things, it's kind of like sometimes I'm eh, seeing two sides of the story. We're going to see this in Ecclesiastes today. It's really important. Big, big, big disclaimer here. There are some absolutes, and I want to give you some of them, probably the most important ones. One. Jesus is God, period. Right. We're not debating that, okay? We can debate some other things. I don't really like debating, but, you know, we can talk about it, not this. If you don't agree with me on this one, go somewhere else, <laughs> right? So, and this includes the gospel about him. We're not going to argue about that. 1 Corinthians 15, what it says, the basic tenets of the gospel, Jesus died, on a cross, according to scriptures, he was buried. He rose again on the third day. Rose from the dead. Spent 40 days. Appeared to many, as Paul says. 500 people. To James, John, the other apostles. And to Paul, like someone who was untimely born. These are the facts. Then he ascended into heaven. Another fact. He's coming back again. Fact. He's coming back again to judge both the living and the dead. We'll get into that. These are facts. Indisputable. Other fact. Absolute. We are called to love everyone, even our enemies. Love everyone. Implicitly, there's no buts, if, ands after that period. Jesus didn't give you an out. Paul didn't give you an out. The Holy Spirit shouldn't give you an out. It's not the Holy Spirit if you feel you have an out. Sin, never a good thing. Sin is never a good thing. That is an absolute. Fun fact, pride is a sin, and it's never a good thing, no matter what your country or culture tells you. Pride is not a good thing. So today, I will summarize Ecclesiastes for you. If you like the type of sermon where someone gives like one or two scriptures and then gives an opinion for 50 minutes, you're going to hate it this morning, right, or love it. <laughs> We're going to do a lot of scriptures this morning. If you like God's Word, you're going to love it here. So this is going to be a good practice. Again, we're not going to read all of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to give you some highlights. 
But when you read it all the way through, you're going to see something here. You might find yourself going, huh? Did the teacher just contradict himself? What happened here? What's going on? Well, this would be called a paradox. A paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. Kind of both. So we just looked at the Proverbs. Let's go there and I'll show you one that happens like really in tight proximity. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Don't answer the foolish arguments of fools or you will become as foolish as they are. Be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools, or they will become wise in their own estimation. This is the problem with the verse of the day. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> so we're going to learn Ecclesiastes 3. There's a time for almost everything. The time for everything. Almost. So again, this is an example of both sides of the coin. And so this brings us to, again, as we've seen, the importance of reading larger portions of text. A good teacher considers the full counsel of God's Word and has it in recent memory. A lot of people make a lot of mistakes because they forget that there's something else there. Ecclesiastes forces us to look at both sides of the coin when we read it through. It shouldn't be read like Proverbs. Proverbs, maybe you can't do the verse of the day, right? But you can parse verses out. Ecclesiastes, you should not do that. You should look at it all the way through in one sitting. It doesn't take long, 20, 30 minutes. Maybe you're willing to invest that for God. Ouch. So look for even so verses. Words like but, yet, both. Now, if Solomon is the teacher, as traditionally thought, we can look at this as a commentary on his own life, and certainly, at very least, a commentary on life itself. We saw that Solomon got it wrong, he invested a lot in himself. First 20 years of his reign, he's building these big buildings for himself, not just the temple. It spends about twice as long on it. It's almost twice as big, too. He invested heavily in that. That was really, really important to him. But here, if we're looking at it, it's probably Solomon writing toward the end of his life or an older man or after all this building. And so what he's going to tell us is this aggressive pursuit of wealth is a waste of time. Then he's going to balance it out a little bit, show us the value of it. So Solomon's probably coming into balance here if this is the person writing it. We looked at lessons learned. <clears throat> so let's dig in. First few verses, Ecclesiastes 1.1. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. So what's going on here? There's a teacher and there's an author. This will be much more clear at the end of Ecclesiastes. A teacher and an author. So the teacher could be Solomon. The author, don't know. He doesn't name himself. Meaningless. You be maybe reading there. It might say vanity, something like that. Interesting word, habel, is Hebrew. Right, so the original texts were written in Hebrew. We just don't really have them anymore. But it's a Hebrew word, and it's symbolic, habel. Remember Cain and Abel? Sounds like habel. Why? He's vapor or dust. His life is cut short. He's there and not quickly. His name is symbolic. So mark it in your Bible. That's the word there. Vanity, meaningless, vapor. 38 times, says it in Ecclesiastes. This translation, meaningless, is good. Like vapor, like chasing the wind. Ecclesiastes 1.12. I, the teacher, was king of Israel, and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it's all meaningless. Like chasing the wind. A hard lesson about chasing things other than God, like all the work he did building the stuff for himself. Now, if you keep reading, it'll say there's nothing new under the sun. We're saving that for next week. We're going to do this in kind of two parts-ish. So we'll turn the page to Ecclesiastes 2.4. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many 
flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. Yeah. I had everything a man could desire. So these are some clues as to why it's Solomon. Richer than any of the other kings. That's probably Solomon. Gold, 25 tons a year of gold. Lots of gold. And we're going to see he had an awful lot of concubines. Kind of interesting. That'll be funny. But... 2, verse 11, but as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all meaningless, like chasing the wind, there was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. So the teacher has not had his coffee yet. He's a little grumpy, right? <laughs> it seems depressing when viewed in the wrong light. But there's a time for everything. Turn the page. Ecclesiastes 3, 1. For everything, there's a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. So here is a very good example. Both. There's a time for almost everything. I want to note something here. This is why we have to read the whole thing all the way through. Because if we stop here and we go, oh, yes, a time for war. I like that. Well, keep reading. Jesus clarifies this. So let's take a look. New Testament, best commentary we have on the old. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It's Jesus talking. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. New Testament clarifies the old. We can hate sin, but not people. Jesus says we're in a time for peace in the same sermon. We are peacemakers. It did say, the law said, but I now say, Jesus, not Jean. You got to keep reading. As I said before, the whole Bible. Lonnie, turn the page. Ecclesiastes 4.1. Again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. So I concluded that the dead are better off than the living. But most fortunate of all are those who are not yet born. For they have not seen all the evil that is done under the sun. Then I observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this, too, is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Turn the page again. Ecclesiastes 5.1. As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. <laughs> it is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises and don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are here on earth. So let your words be few. Too much activity gives you restless dreams and too many words make you a fool. Ecclesiastes 5.7, talk is cheap like daydreams and other useless activities. Fear God instead. Keep that one in your back pocket. And so here, both sides of the coin, even so verses, Ecclesiastes 5.16, and this too is a very serious problem. People leave this world no better off than when they came. All their hard work is for nothing, like working for the wind. Throughout their lives, they live under a cloud, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. Even so, I have noticed one thing, at least, that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them. Except their lot in life. Both sides of the coin. If we turn the page, Ecclesiastes 6, we'll go to 11. The more words you speak, the less they mean. So what good are they? In the few days of our meaningless lives, who knows how our days can be best spent? Our lives are like a shadow. Who can tell what would happen on earth after we're gone? Can tell. Teacher has still not had his coffee. 
So, Ecclesiastes 7, 2, better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. My favorite verse. So the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool only thinks about having a good time. That's actually a good exercise for perspective. I recommend attending one like funeral or memorial service every few months. Gives you very good perspective about what's important. But at the same time, remember he said we should, at least there's one thing that is good, we should also enjoy what we have. We're seeing balance here. So this is the problem when we just read little sections of Scripture. You might just get that takeaway and go, ooh. No, he also said a time for everything. Ecclesiastes 3 teaches us how to read it. Ecclesiastes 7.11, wisdom is even better when you have money. Both are a benefit as you go through life. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Another both example, Ecclesiastes 7.14, enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. If we turn the page, Ecclesiastes 8.16, in my search for wisdom and in my observation of people's burdens here on earth, I discovered that there is ceaseless activity day and night. I realized that no one can discover everything God is doing under the sun. Not even the wisest people discover everything. I wonder what they claim. And again, we're all going to die. Ecclesiastes 9.3, it seems so wrong that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate. Already twisted by evil, people choose their own mad course. For they have no hope. There's nothing ahead but death anyway. The New Testament also clarifies that. We have something to look forward to. If we turn the page, this section is really about some ironies that typify wisdom. It's kind of humorous. Ecclesiastes 10.8. When you dig a well, you might fall in. When you demolish an old wall, you could be bitten by a stake. Just saying. When you work in a quarry, stones might fall and crush you. When you chop wood, there is danger with each stroke of your axe. Don't ever call me a pessimist again. <laughs> this guy's off the charts. <laughs> Using a dull axe requires great strength, so sharpen the blade. That, that's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. If we turn the page, another both teaching, Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1, Send your grain across the seas, and in time, profits will flow back to you. But divide your investments among many places, for you do not know what risks might lie ahead. Save, spend, both. Again, Ecclesiastes 11.8. When people live to be very old, let them rejoice in every day of life. But... Let them also remember there will be many dark days. Everything still to come is meaningless. Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. You will stand before the judge. We'll get into that. So, Ecclesiastes 12.1, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. <laughs> Remember him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes and the rain clouds continually darken your day. Remember your creator. Chapter 12, remember your creator repeats that. And then the teacher concludes, 12.8, Everything is meaningless. Vanity, vapor, says the teacher, completely meaningless. Now, the author, here's where it's a little bit more clear. The author gives us some final thoughts. Ecclesiastes 12.9. Keep this in mind. The teacher was considered wise, and he taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. The teacher sought to find just the right words to express truths clearly. The words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful, but helpful. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick with which a shepherd drives the sheep. But, my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful, for writing books is endless and much study wears you out. I know. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing whether good or bad. Final conclusion. 
fear God and obey his commands because he will judge us for everything we do. And there's no but after that. So we must apply both sides of the coin to teachings on fear and judgment and clear up some very common false teaching. I'll begin with fear. Remember, we were in Proverbs a couple of weeks ago, so let's start there. We saw that fear is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1.7, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. On that wisdom, in case you think you're smart, Proverbs 3.7, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Interesting. The Bible says the opposite on the topic of fear than the world does. The wise fear, Proverbs 14, 16. The wise fear and avoid danger. Fools plunge ahead with reckless confidence. Sadly, many Christians have let worldly teachings infect their Christianity. It's no good. They'll even go as far as to say fear is a sin. So now they're afraid of being afraid. <laughs> kind of crazy, right? A lot of people believe that. But the Bible doesn't say that. I'm going to keep going, too, so you get the point. Now, I think most of us would agree that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Can we agree on that? If you don't, I'll see you in my office or not. But anyway... <laughs> It's a lot of misinformation. So it applies also to Christianity. Just got to let you know that. And I think we would agree that there's a lot of misinformation on the internet. A lot. And if it's from my perspective, I'm in the word a lot, there's more false teaching out there than accurate teaching. But it's like this if you go into any industry. Your vocation, your job, whatever you do, right? There's a lot of people that have opinions about what you do or how to do it, but most people don't know what they're talking about. Most of the most popular articles out there about your job or what you do are incorrect, at least in my job. They're not accurate. So I think we can agree <laughs> there's a lack of quality fact-checking, correct? We can agree on that. Have you ever seen something like this? Ever seen that? Something like, it says, do not be afraid 365 times in the Bible. Have you ever shared it? Maybe. You're scared now. <laughs> something like it. Maybe you shared it, but did you bother to fact check it? Maybe you like, read your Bible. You see, as soon as I got into the Word more and more and more, constantly reading it, I saw this. I was like, that just does not sound right. It tells us to fear a lot more. And it says, don't. Yes, it does say we shouldn't be afraid in certain circumstances, like Joshua. All right, Jesus uses it a few times. Fine. But I hear you got to fear the Lord more than like anything else. If you're in the Word, you'd know this is wrong. It's completely inaccurate. So sorry, Toby Mac. You're wrong. Wrong. He's not speaking life. He's speaking lies. And we're going to see today why well, this is a very dangerous teaching. That's a popular guy. I was saddened by the response because a Bible nerd like me saw it. And they're like, this is not right. They commented and they went in their Logos Bible software and they counted. Now, this guy came up with, I think, around 500 fears. And out of that, 119 fear nots. So, <laughs> this is interesting. So, the actual stats may shock you. I didn't even believe this guy. Oh, and you know what they said? Oh, thanks for the accountability, but, you know, God tells us we don't have to be afraid. There's another lie. You know what I mean? It's just, wow. It's popular. People have 
I don't even know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of fans, and teachers behind him saying the same thing. Popular teachers. Read your Bible, man. Irresponsible. So here's what I did. I got a concordance. So I went into Kara Lee's office. I said, I need a ruler. And she's like, oh, no, what now? You know, so I got a ruler, and I needed like a guide, right, because my eyes play tricks on me. And when you get a concordance, all the writing is really small. And so I was like this, because I'm getting older, right? And I don't like to wear my glasses. So <clears throat> I'm going through, and I looked up fear, the words fear. This is really hard to do because Strong's Concordance, I think they take in this particular one like a bunch of different versions of the Bible and they give you like a cross section. So it's difficult. You have to consider the Hebrew and how they're going to render fear. You have to consider the Greek, especially if it's the Greek. Very difficult. So I got about ish 500, like this guy, it was right around 500 instances of the word fear. And when I counted, I got about 100 times it says do not fear. It's a far cry from 365, isn't it? Wow, this is a very popular teaching. So frame it this way. 70 to 80% of the time is telling us you should fear or giving us instances of being afraid or neutral. It's a little bit difficult to do in these concordances, but you get the point. Most of the time it's saying, be afraid. So don't believe everything you read on the internet even if it's from someone famous, or maybe especially if it's from someone famous. Now, I was able to do the Greek more easily. So if the New Testament is the lens by which we're looking at the old, I can do that because I can read some words in Greek. I can read it okay. And so I want to give you the definition because here's another problem that we have in church. Now, Theodora will tell you the problem with their pronunciation. It is not phobos, it is phobos. Did I get it? I got a nod. I'm going to stop there. That's all the Greek that I'm going to do for you today. I'll take the A. All right, maybe not an A, I don't know. I'm giving myself grades now. All right, so I want you to understand this. And here's a funny thing. Even scholars, you got to watch it. Because instead of going to Greek people and saying, how do we pronounce these words? They decided to just make up their own pronunciations of the words. It's called standard Greek. It's a real thing, and it's kind of stupid. Anyway, ask a Greek. That's probably how they pronounced it. So here's what it means. The definition is correct. Biblical definition. Panic, flight, fear, the causing of fear, or terror. Now, another false teaching. It means awe, awe of God, because he's Santa Claus, and he loves us. Nope. No. There are different words for reverence, and I'm not going to try to pronounce them. I was going to, but you're here now. So anyway, there are different words for reverence and awe and things like that. This is terror. Reverence is like this. Terror, it connotates fleeing, running away. Got another nod. I'm doing well. I'll stop. So anyway, it's like you're feeling terror. <laughs> it's horrible. It's not a good thing at all. That's the truth. That's the real definition. Now, in the New Testament, there are 144 occurrences of that word and two other variations of it, but it's a form of that word. 144 times. 44 are neutral. It's just like somebody being afraid, like the disciples in the boat. Ah, it's a ghost. No, it's Jesus. Like that. That's where that is. All right, so it's just an example. So we erase the 44 because it's not telling us to be afraid or not or that it's okay or that it's not. Out of, out of those 100 fears, out of those 100 fears, only 37 times does it say, do not be afraid. The other 63, you should be afraid. Wow. The majority of the time, the Bible is saying, fear is wisdom. So I want to give you some context. We're going to go quick here. Starting with the early church. We'll start in Acts. You may be familiar with this first verse. A lot of people read this, Acts 2.42. And they were devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being performed by the apostles. 
Nobody says that. Next verse. When we look at Paul's letters to the church in Romans, he's talking about those who have sinned and they're not seeking God. They're not good people. And he says this of them. Romans 3.18. They have no fear of God at all. It's not a good thing. Maybe we should. Paul, he's then referring to the Jews who have not accepted Jesus. They're like branches that were broken off from the tree of Abraham. And the Gentiles, that's us if you're not Jewish, we're from the wild olive tree. And we're like branches that have been grafted in. Then he says this, don't brag about it. Romans 11:20. yes. But remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think too highly of yourself, but fear. Fear what could happen. In his letters to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 3, I came to you in weakness and fear with much trembling. Means like tremors, right? I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I was doing good. I'll keep the good grade. Paul has fear and trembling. 2 Corinthians 5, 11, Therefore, because we know the fear of the Lord, we are attempting to persuade people, but... We are revealed to God, and I hope to be revealed in your consciences because they're ambassadors. They live in the fear of the Lord. Now, in that letter, it's really interesting because it comes up at least four more times. 2 Corinthians 7, he says, he and Timothy, Paul and Timothy, they have fears within. They're frightened to the point of death. Then he says, fear Titus. Context for writing this letter, they're dragging, it's false teachers, and also they're dragging their feet on an offering to go back to Jerusalem. So I'm going to send Titus, check up on you, fear him. What? In Ephesians, talking about husbands and wives being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Slaves, slaves obey your earthly masters with fear, and there's that trembling again, same Greek word, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Philippians 2.12, therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, Paul is writing, but now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with, same phrase, fear and trembling. We don't tremble with awe or respect. We tremble with fear. We tremble because we're terrified. 1 Peter 1.17, and remember, that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites, he will judge. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in, I crossed out reverence there, it is not there in the Greek, you must live in fear. That's all it says in the Greek. I read this while I was preparing this week. I can assure you of that, of him during your time here as temporary residents. Even our Bible translations in English, water it down. He will judge. Remember, this is to Christians. Peter is writing, the lead apostle, he's writing this to Christians and saying he will judge you. What? That doesn't sound like what I learned in cheap and easy church. But this isn't cheap, easy church. I'm telling you the truth. So live in fear. You should be a little scared. Like Paul said, work your salvation out. Don't just kick back and be like, I'm good. No. No. Read Hebrews 12, 10. I'll give you some homework. It says, if we keep intentionally sinning, we've trampled on the blood of Christ. That's what it says. Look it up. Check my work. Now look, I understand the truth does not feel good. Truth usually hurts. But it also doesn't feel good to be lied to, does it? Some of you might be sitting there. Maybe you're angry at me. Don't be. Be angry at the person who lied to you. I'm just reading you God's word. That's all I'm doing. And I'm even correcting it when I don't think it lines up with the Greek. The original translation is the best. And so I take the time to do that. And I'm telling you the truth. I'm also telling you, check my work. Don't just believe me because it's on the screen. But maybe that was the problem in the first place. Unfortunately, the majority of what is taught about the Bible is misinformation. Feelings are not facts. So why do so many false teachers exist? Here's where we have to take a little responsibility for it. I reached a point in my walk where I was like, ooh, kind of my fault. I had it all right in front of me. All I had to do was read it. 
People don't read the Bible. And even when they do, people love to lawyer the Bible. They love buffet Christianity. Ooh, that sounds nice. Or that sounds nice. They're not taking the whole thing into consideration. It's copy and paste Christianity. It's not real. Second, people like feelings. And these false teachings, they feel really good. It feels good not to have to fear anything. Lie to yourself. Does that feel any better? I don't know. Maybe it does. And that's why false teachers have a lot of followers. They want to feel good. But if you read the Bible a lot, you know this. God is more concerned with your faith than with your feelings. It's why the Bible sounds negative. When you were listening to this, did it sound negative? Yeah! Yeah! But that's how the Bible reads. God's concerned with your faith. But we want everything to feel good. Thing is, we should have faith in our Father and fear Him as the Word of God commands. Because lack of fear leads to failure. Here's a key verse. Proverbs 16.6 Unfailing love and faithfulness make atonement for sin. By fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. Soak that in for a second. That's the key. We should be too afraid to sin. By fearing the Lord keeps us away from sin. If I'm conscious of that judgment, or I'm reading Hebrews 10, read it, I'm trampling on the blood of Christ, and I think maybe I'm going to die today or tomorrow, might not do it. You should have this right here all the time. That's what the Bible says. Really interesting. Someone shared a teaching with me yesterday, and I kind of got caught by it a little. It sounded good. It was really popular, popular teachers, pastors, whatever. And, you know, they're talking about how the devil's coming after him. The enemy's coming after us. And he's going to use all these tactics. And I agreed with a lot of them. Busy work. That's one of them. He's going to keep us so busy. He's going to do this. And I'm listening, and I'm saying, okay, that sounds good. And I watch, back, watch it again, listen, and the guy said, the devil wants to plant fear in you. You know, he wants to make you anxious about things. And I'm like, oh, hold on, stop. Let me turn these really popular people off. Get off my phone, Satan. You know why? That's not what the Bible says. Think about it. Most of you know this story. Jesus is tempted. He's impelled into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He's kind of hungry. So the first temptation, what does he say? If you're hungry, if you're the Son of God, turn the stone to a piece of bread. What does Jesus do? Deuteronomy 8. Man, a man doesn't live off of bread alone. He quotes Scripture. But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, the devil says, I'll try something different. He brings him up to the top of the temple. And Luke, these happen in reverse order. So we're in Matthew 4 now, or Luke 4. Goes up to the top of the temple. So jump off if you're the Son of God. He's going to send his angels. They'll take you by their hands and lift you up. You won't even dash your foot on a stone. Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. Here's his scripture. Did you catch that? But think about it, right? Then he takes them to the mountain. I'll give you all the kingdoms. Think about it for a second here. Don't test the Lord. Quotes Deuteronomy again. It says, no, Jesus rebukes him with scripture. Devil uses scripture. Interesting to know. But what did he do? Did he tell Jesus, be afraid to jump off to the temple? Did he say that? No. He said, don't be afraid, right? Essentially. That's the paraphrase. Jump off. Don't worry about it. God's going to take care of you. No, the devil does the opposite if we're looking at scripture correctly and not listening to some fool. Be afraid to jump off there. <laughs> don't test the Lord. Not good. So it says the opposite. I'm listening to it. I'm encouraging you guys. Turn that stuff off and just read your Bible. You can listen to it too. Listen to the Word of God. Instead of a lot of this nonsense. That's why I use so many scriptures. Because sometimes if I get going, I'll say some nonsense. I'm going to stop soon so I don't say any. <sighs> Through lack of fear, many have shipwrecked their faith. It's the key verse. 
False teachings are easy to follow. They don't require any commitment. It's simple. But as we saw, that's not how the Word of God reads. It's not simple. It's complicated. As Christians, we're being called to be wise. Do you know that? Wise. We're supposed to be smart people. And if we weren't before we came in, and some of you know my story, the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom. Because he did. He gave me wisdom where I didn't have it before. Cured me of things. I don't kind of have them a little bit, but not as much as before. (laughs) People like cheap and easy, if we're being honest. It doesn't require thinking because thinking is hard. Thinking is hard. We don't want to do that, but the Bible says we should not be lazy. As Christians, we're smart. The Holy Spirit gives us discernment, power, dunamis. We have that in us if we're Christians. Now, here's the thing. You may like, I'm not pointing to anyone, but you may like cheap and easy Christianity. You may like that. But I'm going to ask you a question. How's it working for you? How's it working for you? Now, not now, not when you just got dressed up for church and you came in here. I'm not talking about that you. I'm talking about when you're home alone and you think no one's watching. We don't believe that God's watching you. We think you can hide from him. How's it working then? How's it working? Oh, I like this. This message sounds really hard and we're going a little long today. That's you. How's it working for you really? started really getting convicted. Like, what? Now, we're a good church because somebody noted, I took my watch off, like, give that thing to Satan, because I check it a lot. But I notice a lot of you don't check it a lot. So this is, we're going in a positive direction. But, but, for who we used to be, oh my gosh. We had an usher just sitting in the back the whole time like this. You know, but, but honestly, if I asked you to stay here for an extra hour today, what would be the problem with that? Like, real, practically, uh, you're hungry? Don't tell me the game's on, because I'm going to yell at you. <laughs> like, you're going to go home to watch a bunch of dudes chase a ball around instead of the Word of God? Come on. Come on. But think about it. Pastors are worried about this. Somebody, they have a clock in the back. I was asked this by a guest. Oh, you, you know, I ask them, oh, I try to keep it around a half hour, but why do I do that? Why do I do that? And they watch a clock, and if they go longer, they get fired. That's a real thing. Come, talk about putting the Holy Spirit in a box. You know, we have a problem that we can't spend like two hours in church or all day at church. Talk to some people like from different places. They're like, man, no, we come back to church. We eat. We do Bible study. I'm like, I'm moving to Puerto Rico. They do that there. (laughs) We're not going to go two hours. But if you're thinking that, that's the problem. It's a problem. I'm a little hungry. You know, it's like, oh. But let me ask you, if that's you, how is the cheap version working for you? I'm not talking about church you. I'm not talking about Facebook you. I'm not talking about Instagram you. I'm not talking about LinkedIn you. I'm talking about you. How is it working for you? Really? Don't tell me. Tell God. Maybe you're fooling your friends. You're not fooling God. Who will judge you for your behavior? That goes back to having fear of him. If you want more scriptures on that, I can keep going. I suggest reading Romans 14 all the way through and 2 Corinthians 5. And all of 1 Peter, judgment begins with us, it says. You see, it's that lack of fear that makes you feel like you can get away with these things. That's the key verse. But if we're calling ourselves Christian, we must receive divine discipline with fear of the Lord, which furthers our faith. So here's wisdom. I'm going to give it to you. From the greatest teacher of all time, 
King Jesus. Luke 12, 4. Dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body, for they cannot do any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. It's Jesus, not the Pastor Gene version, King Jesus version. Yes, he's the one to fear three times. So there's a both, right? I'll tell you whom not to fear. I acknowledge that. But he doubles down on fearing God. Perhaps we should have a fear of fire. Now, Ecclesiastes concludes with this reality, and so we should today, honoring the text that we're in. Here's what I want to do. We're going to do something a little special today. I want to offer you in an opportunity to join me in being real. I'm not going to do the raise your hand thing because it puts people on the spot. But I want to be real church, real people. I'm sick of it. I'm just sick of what I'm seeing. I'm going to be honest. Sick of it. Sick of people calling themselves Christians, and it's like they don't even resemble anything that we see in the biblical text. I'm really sick of teachers who care more about how many butts they're putting in seats and their bank accounts and all that stuff. It sickens me. And they're slaves to the mortgage or slaves to their salaries. They're closing the books. They won't show anybody what they make. Why? They're false teachers. I'm sick of it. And as a result, what's happening? We're seeing Christians just fall off. Right? Like the parable of the sower, the weeds come up. Because they had no root, gone. So if that's you, if you're tired of the show, if you're tired of the show, we came here, I got tired of the show. I took the worship team away. It's like, just get up on saying the tracks have no ego and they don't mess up. I'm done with it. If you're tired of the show, if you want to join me in being real, real church, real people, getting deeper roots so we don't burn up. If you're tired of it, these false starts, false starts every Sunday, right? Every Sunday. Oh, you want to recommit yourself to the Lord again? This week? What? Huh? What are you talking about? False starts. Oh, now I'm just going to go do it again. I'm going to do it again. If you're sick of it, if you're done with it, if you want a deep relationship with the Lord, I'm inviting you to join me, to participate in what we're doing here. And so I want to offer you prayer. We're going to have some people come forward. I don't see Dan and Lucille here. It's hard to see with the lights. But I know uh, Tony, Crystal, I want you to come forward on the sides of the stage here. And here's the thing. We're going to go right into a worship song. But if you need prayer, here's the thing. If you've got something weighing you down, something weighing you down, if sin is weighing you down, it begins with us. We can't go out there and complain about the world. First of all, that if they're not Christians, read 1 Corinthians 5. We're not supposed to be doing that anyway. The church, judge those in the church. Out in the world, we're supposed to love them. But I see too many Christians complaining, complaining, complaining. It's projection. You're mad and angry about all the sin you're participating in and taking it out on them. That's what you're really angry about. There's no righteous indignation here. You're not Jesus. You're sinning. This is the truth. And you're taking it out on them so that they don't look at you. If you're done with that, if you're done with that, if you want that weight lifted, we're going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray for you. If you want revival, it begins with us. It begins with us. If you want to come back to God, if you want to get in deep, deep relationship here, if you're done with the shallowness, if you want real church, real people, we want to pray for you. I want to see revival in this community, but it begins with every one of us. I'm going to kick off this worship and this prayer with a psalm, the original worship psalms. Psalm 90, starting at verse 7. Seventy years are given to us. Some even live to 80. 
But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they will disappear and we fly away. Who can comprehend the power of your anger, God? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Thank you.